Recording live from the Hoban Law Group here in Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Eric Singular. We're sitting alongside president and founder of the Hoban Law Group, Bob Hoban. Today we're talking about how cannabis industry investment has fared in the days of COVID, and we are joined by the CEO of Arcview Ventures, Jeffrey Finkel. Jeff, thank you for being here with us this evening. Thanks, Eric, and thanks, Bob. Well, it's such a pleasure to finally get you here on the Hoban Minute podcast. And before we jump into the meat of this conversation, I just want to ask you, uh, Jeff, what inspired you? What drove you toward this industry? It seems that everybody we talk to has some special reason, something that attracted them. And uh, if you would just give us a little bit about what made you foray into the wild and wacky cannabis industry. Well, you know, I guess I don't have a personal story around a health issue. So knock on wood, thank God for that. Um, you know, I've spent the last 25 years as a professional investor, either as an angel investor or a venture fund manager. Um, and, you know, as we're sort of getting around 2012, 13, 14 in the tech industry, um, there seemed to be a lot of sameness and a lot of me too businesses. We were looking across SaaS, we were looking across mobile, and I was at the point where I wasn't seeing so much evolution. This was a little bit in front of AI and machine learning. So my lens was up to look for another sector where I could practice my craft. And I had the good fortune to run into an old friend of mine who I'd known for a number of years, and he was, you know, starting the first FINRA licensed investment bank focused on cannabis. And I, I kind of knew what was going on in the cannabis industry, but I hadn't studied it. And so through my, um, you know, reconnection with my friend, I started to go deep and really understood what was happening. And I could see that capital was being aggregated to fund early stage companies in that industry. And I thought that this would be, um, a real good place to focus my efforts. There was a real supply and demand imbalance um, for capital serving, you know, seed and early stage companies. Quite frankly, there still is. But at the time, that to me, you know, really sort of created the interest to move forward into the space. Jeff, what, so to sum it up, it's re it's it's really about the business opportunity for me. No, well, that that's what drives this thing forward, as we all know. You don't stumble into an industry. Um, folks certainly need to uh, be focused. And you know, speaking of focused, uh, one of your colleagues uh, at the the Arcview Ventures is my good friend Gene Sullivan. Talk a little bit about how far you guys go back, because uh, I actually should have said the great Gene Sullivan. It would have been more appropriate. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, how, how far do you guys go back? And uh, do you share similar philosophies in this space? So your good friend Gene Sullivan is sitting um, closer than 15 yards from me right now, although we're in different rooms, so I can have a little peace and quiet. Gene and I go back a long way. So I started a venture capital fund in 1999 called Odeon Capital Partners. We were uh, probably the first first time fund ever to, to sort of emerge in New York. And remember, this goes back 1999 before New York was really the mecca of venture capital since become. Um, so we were unique in that way. And Jean with her partners were starting Starvest. Um, their first fund, I think, was a year, a year earlier than ours. Uh, and then there was a second fund a few years after ours. So Gene and I looked at deals. Um, we both had a focus on SaaS. And uh, I came to know and, and really respect and like it. We didn't do a deal together when we were both in tech. But it was certainly great to reconnect with her as she was, you know, ahead of me at ArcView um, with the ambition to put together a fund under the ArcView umbrella. So it's great. It's a great working relationship. It's built on 25 years of knowing each other and looking at deals and just tremendous mutual respect. Quite frankly, I could not have a better partner um, than I have in Gene. No, it's, uh, that's, that's, that's quite, uh, 
quite the combination there with the two of you at, uh, at ArcView Ventures. And, of course, uh, most of our listeners know ArcView as uh, one of the original platforms in this space that allowed for companies to come on and uh, make pitches in a more formalized, more professional setting uh, early in the early days of the industry, so to speak. Um, things were not always clear. Uh, things were certainly not always professional. And ArcView brought a, a platform and a foundation that to build upon, and, and you've certainly built upon that um, through transitions in leadership and different focus. But ArcView Ventures is a fund um, that you're involved with and lead at. Uh, uh, t- talk a little bit about how it's structured and what its intent is. For sure. So let's let's back up a little bit. So ArcView, as you well know. Um, is a membership organization put in place to serve the cannabis industry. I think some $300 million has found its way to over 300 companies through members of the ArcView network, um, meeting companies at the events that they've held for years. They've, they've, you know, typically in a year do six large thought leadership events. Of course, in the age of COVID, there's, they're shifting more to digital. And um, Arcview's really got a unique sort of place in this industry. And I think uh, a lot of the, the way this industry has been funded has been through Arcview. The challenge for Arcview is, is that the revenue model was really that of a membership organization. They didn't sort of benefit from being involved in those transactions and getting a transaction fee. So about a year ago, Arcview went out and raised a Series A financing um, the ambition of the investors was sort of to change the complexity and the trajectory of ArcView and unlock some of that potential into additional revenue streams. So the new ArcView uh, is, you know, sort of, I think of it as a three-legged stool. The first leg is what you know ArcView to be as a membership organization that publishes research and holds events. The second leg is uh, a partnership and a JV with a broker-dealer. That broker-dealer got its FINRA license in May. It's called ArcView Capital, and they're a traditional broker-dealer. They're doing capital raises, M&A advisory, and other services for issuers. And then the third leg of the school of the stool is ArcView Ventures. And ArcView Ventures is responsible for the principal investing of ArcView. So, under, so it's basically a holding company uh, underneath the ArcView umbrella that underneath it will create a number of different principal investing funds. The very first fund, which I actually created outside of the ArcView umbrella and have since rolled in, is the ArcView Collective Fund. And the ArcView Collective Fund is uniquely member managed. It's sort of a new structure. And I guess the best way to think about it is a hybrid between a traditional venture capital fund and a loosely coupled angel network. Our limited partners, we refer to them as members, it's a member managed fund, but these limited partners have a small percentage of their LP commitment allocated to the general partner. So what that simply means is these members, and we have 50 of them, they vote on how the fund is run and in which companies the fund invests and we do it through a four stage vetting process that is organized through a committee structure. So investors coming in get the ability to participate because they're part of the decision making process, but we fund out of the funds treasury and that decision making process that they're involved in is backed up by the experience of a professional team. So it's kind of a cool structure. Um, I felt that ArcView was really the perfect platform for this kind of this kind of structure because ArcView had individual angel investors. They were go it aloneers, if you know what I mean, where they would look at a company and you know decide which cap table they wanted to be on and which company to fund. Um, sometimes with great consternation, and this gave them a better way to become a collaborative decision maker, to work in a group, to vet companies in a group, to join due diligence committees, uh, to see companies present in an organized structure, to learn from some some investors more experienced than them, 
And um, for some people um, that had a lot of experience, they had the ability to cross-educate to those that didn't. And it created a community around investing, but with the discipline of an institutional fund structure. So that's how it works. Um, we've got 50 members today. We're on, on a steady march to get to 100. That's our goal. The, the fund has done nine investments, and um, we're, we're just enjoying ourselves. And, you know, the we met in person, but in the age of COVID, we've gone completely digital, and it's really been a great experience. Because quite frankly, our meetings are between five and seven, two Tuesdays a month, and that's a very awkward time when you throw in a commute. So the fact that everybody's working from home means our engagement uh, is, is just tremendous. So we're, we're just getting a ton of our members on every call, and it's just been a, a tremendous experience. Well, and, and, and engagement is, is really uh, what's the foundation of uh, what I've witnessed, at least through my participation in our few events over the years, is that uh, the members, the folks that are involved are – uh, very engaged and collectively, um, I can appreciate your model because the collective knowledge of the individual investors in this space um, is very high compared to other groups that I've I, I've talked to, uh, uh, worked with, and 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 performed legal services for because the folks that um, that invest in Arcview related ventures, uh, Arcview related uh, structures and and, and companies. Uh, tend to be far more active, far more uh, inquisitive, and really, uh, like I said, as a collective body, I can understand why you've uh, structured it as such and, and so decided to take advantage of that that knowledge, that industry expertise, and I think that that will set you off on the right foot. And as I understand it, the focus is early stage uh, opportunities that have high potential for growth. But for a moment, let's look at the opposite of early stage investors, and that would be acquisitions of distressed assets, acquisitions of companies that are perhaps liquidating. And uh, I recently wrote an article in Forbes uh, entitled Another One Bites the Dust, just recapping some of the, the, the things that we've seen across this country with the med men's of the world and Jen Canna's of the world, so forth and so on. And the picture I attempted to paint was that this is the natural evolution of an industry. This is how industries evolve. Certainly there are some things about those two illustrative scenarios that I painted with those two companies that are not exactly what you'd want to see uh, done with your investment. Um, but at the end of the day, it creates distressed assets. It creates scenario where those assets go to live another life. And there are, in fact, investment strategies for that as well. Can you just talk a little bit about that, just in terms of your observations of industry and your investment career? And is this normal? And does it create uh, opportunity? Or is it a bleak picture, as some of the, t uh, the, the, the industry publications would paint? There's a lot of questions in there. Yeah, you're, 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 your attorney's <laughs> supposed to object. That was a compound question. Um, <laughs> that was that was yeah. absolutely a compound. So let me <laughs> let let me try to unpack it. Sure. So it's a little bit it's a little bit different from cannabis. It was accelerated, and it was accelerated for a number of reasons. The first of which was an active reverse takeover uh, uh, market in Canada. You know, for years in tech, there was always the notion of reverse mergers. It was the financing tactic of the last resort when companies couldn't get funded by venture capital or private equity. In cannabis, it quickly became the norm. And, you know, um, many investment banks sort of made this their core practice. And lots of companies went public long before they should have not just from the standpoint of having um, predictable earnings, but just management that was ill-equipped to deal with the environment they had to deal with in running a public company. So that really sort of pushed this drive up in valuation um, and the precipitous decline by a lot of these companies. We've seen it. We've seen you know, problems at, at Canna Trust with the legal product getting into their supply chain. We saw it at MedMen with alleged, and I say alleged, insider dealings. So I would say that 
you've seen these kinds of cycles in tech. I mean, I lived through the dot-com boom and bust. I lived through, you know, the 2008 uh, financial crisis, which had, you know, a terrible effect on the tech industry at all, at all levels in the stack from growth capital, to seed to early stage. Um, but this really was uh, much more pronounced in the cannabis industry. Now, as far as the stress is concerned, so I think the stress is a great opportunity right now. I'm willing to bet that that opportunity is a 12 to 18 month opportunity, probably skewing more to the 12 month side, because this industry is starting to rebalance from that precipitous decline. I think the, you know, the decline in the public is something like 90%. It's already rebounded about 29%. Uh, the American Cannabis Stock Index, I think, is up 29% from its low. So it's writing itself. Um, so I think that the stress is an opportunity, but I'm not one that thinks that that's a two- or three-year investment horizon. I think it's short of that. And I think a lot of funds that are out there raising distressed funds right now to take advantage of this opportunity would be best served to have both the distressed and growth capital focus because when you're considering a five-year investment horizon for most funds, it's really going to be the first year, year and a half that's going to be distressed, and then it's going to be growth capital. Hmm. So it's a little different. No, it's a, those are all excellent points, and certainly I think something that our listeners really care about. Uh, those of those of our listeners who are considering uh, whether they're investing in cannabis for the first time or looking at this picture and looking at what's happened over the last couple of years and the Canadian cautionary tale, I think, as we've characterized it a few times here on the Hoban Minute. But I just want to ask you, in very simple terms, why is it so hard to invest in cannabis? Or is it really not that much harder than anything else? Does it really take that crystal ball? Can you apply the same strategies and manners as you would in other industries, or is it very, very different and nuanced? What do you think? I think it's different. I think investing in cannabis is hard, and here's why I think it's hard. One, we live in this gray area between state legality and federal illegality, right? Two, the infrastructure for the industry is just developing, right? Insurance is expensive. Um, it's hard to get real estate. We're dealing with you know, a, a, a tax code that is ill-suited for breeding successful companies, you know, 280E. Each state has a different program, so you need to understand the rules governing 34 different jurisdictions. And probably the hardest part, I think, for, for funds or professional investors is that cannabis isn't one thing. Most people think, when you, they think of cannabis, they think of the cannabis industry, they think of cultivation, they think of retail, and maybe CPG. But when you really think about it, cannabis is 12 distinct subsectors, each that have very different characteristics in terms of financial efficiency, timeline to exit, and operating expertise. You have cultivation and retail. You have ag tech. You have software and media analytics. You have brands. You have CPG. You have biotech. You have pharma. Um, you have miscellaneous and silly. You have services that grow up to support the industry. You have security. It, it, they're all very, very different, and it's really hard to be an expert in all of them. By the way, I would just point out, that's the key reason that I thought the collective fund made the most sense in cannabis, because within the collective, we have expertise across not all of those subsectors, and we're focused on six of those 12 subsectors, but we have expertise across those six. So when we see the CPG deal, We've got, you know, a gentleman who was the uh, former global chief uh, global marketing officer for the largest liquor company in the world as one of our members. We have an experienced biotech uh, private equity executive that, you know, when it's medical devices or pharma or, or a biotech company, he's our lead. So we're able to sort of solve for the expertise that we needed uh, across the membership in the fund. But it's hard. That's why cannabis investing is hard. Now, just to, to build on the second part of your compound question, which is, is it all bleak? How do you juxtapose the notion that the public markets declined 90%, sure, they've rebounded maybe 29%, but at the same time, in that same year, 
the industry grew 34%. That is remarkable. And not only did they grow 34%, we have to realize that we're sitting here today where only 11 states plus DC have adult rec programs. So we're very early in terms of the size of the market and the realization um, of the size that this industry is going to be. And, you know, the biggest difference that I think about from when I was investing in the infrastructure layer of the web in 1999, the application layer, you know, in 2007 and eight, is this. Demand did not exist in those days. When we were laying the pipes for the web, it was to create e-commerce. It didn't exist. It was to create digital media. It didn't exist. It was to create cloud-based computing. It didn't exist. The cannabis industry, depending on whose numbers you want to believe today, is between 70, between 50 and $70 billion. That is going to transition from an illicit market to a legal market over some period of time, whether that's six, eight, 10, or 12 years, demand exists and it's a transition game. And that is the unique characteristic that, that makes this exciting. And we're still very, very early. Those are fascinating figures. And I'm so thankful that you shared that with us because it really does paint that picture and makes the case that it's not as bleak as some may think. And for uh, to the point, of it being difficult to invest in cannabis and really needing uh, a guide. Jeff, your expertise shines, and I just want to highlight for any of our listeners who want to uh, listen to you or find more information about what you're doing, uh, there's, of course, the ArcView Ventures website. That is arcviewventures.com. But it looks like you also have a, a blog of sorts called Think About It. I love it, F-I-N-K, and that's Think About It, thinkabout.it. And there's a lot of great information on there. Uh, we thank you so much for coming and joining us here on the Hoban Minute and shedding light on these uh, fascinating topics. Eric, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Hoban Minute. Do you have any ideas for episode topics or guests? We would like to hear from you. Reach out to us at media at hoban.law and stay tuned for more on the Hoban Minute. <laughs>